Welcome back, everybody, to this week's bonus episode of the DCL Duo podcast brought to you by My Path Unwinding Travel. And it is just me this evening. Sam is battling a little bout of bronchitis in our household. So I'm uh, hoping that she is well enough to record again soon. But today it will just be me solo. But that's okay, because I am joined by a fabulous guest, Leslie. So let me start by welcoming Leslie to our show. Welcome, Leslie. Thank you so much for having me. So for those of you not in the know, Leslie is the brains behind Trips with Tykes, a wonderful travel blog that uh, Sam and I actually read from time to time and enjoy. Um, We got a chance to meet Leslie live and in person. I think it was at Elani. And did we also meet up at Disneyland at one point? Both. We ran into each other spontaneously at Aulani realized we overlapped for a day and I came and said (laughs) hi at your cabana. And then we ended up at Disneyland for, I forget what it was, but um, there was some opening or something. Some reason I was there for Star Wars. Was it Star Wars? No, it was, it was later than that. Might have been Maybe Mickey it was and Mickey Minnie's. and Minnie's. Yeah, yeah. I think that was it. Yeah. So, yes. And then you, too, uh, have a podcast along with your co-host, Joe, Disney Deciphered, which is a favorite of ours as well. So excited to have you on today. And uh, we're going to be putting our running shoes on, I guess, because we got to move fast because we're booking a last minute cruise. We're talking pros and cons of booking a last minute Disney Cruise Line cruise, which you did recently. Before we dive into the topic, though, Leslie, we always love to ask folks what their Disney background is. Yours is extensive, so maybe I'll just ask, what's your background with Disney Cruise Line? Very little. Um, I have a lot more background with Disneyland and Disney World in Aulani, but we have only taken one Disney cruise before our most recent one. It was in 2017. It was actually just me and the two kids at the time with my aunt along to help. Three night crazy, you know, just castaway key and back, um, you know, way too fast, especially with a toddler. And we've been wanting to do one for years, but COVID intervened. We actually had a, a booking initially uh, for the summer of 2020 to Alaska that was not to be. So we kept rescheduling and rescheduling and booking different kinds of cruises. And then one of us caught COVID and we had to cancel one. I yeah. mean, it was just a comedy of errors. We have so many cruises that we canceled, but finally we made one happen for um, spring break of 2023. Nice. So three night in 2017, you said, so that must have been the dream that you were on or was it a different ship? It was the wonder. Oh, it, the wonder. Was, okay. Yeah. 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 Is it out of Port Canaveral or someplace else? It was. It was. Okay. And it was just Castaway Key and back. And it, I mean, it felt way too fast, way too fast. Wow. So no stop at Nassau, just Castaway? Just Castaway. Well, that's that's a, sometimes a blessing in disguise in our opinion. So that's, <laughs> that's great. Um, that's what I hear. <laughs> well, so you decided to book a last minute Disney cruise. D- define last minute here. How close to sailing were you when you booked this thing? Ooh, less than 60 days, but more than 30, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, We had had a cruise booked for Thanksgiving week of 2022 that we had to cancel because of COVID hitting the household. And we at the time didn't reschedule. Disney was wonderful. They let us actually just cancel, gave us a full refund, no questions asked. And we thought, okay, the next chance we get, we'll jump on it and, you know, we delayed making spring break plans that year and realized, you know what? There's a cruise out of San Diego right during spring break week, which coincides with Easter for my kids being in Catholic school. And we live in San Francisco, very easy to get to San Diego. And we just jumped on it. Those San Diego cruises are so nice out here on the West Coast. I'm so disappointed that they seem to be dwindling here uh, in the recent itinerary release. I'm I'm still hopeful that with the addition of two more ships in the fleet, we might see something come back. Cause it was really nice to have that wonder kind of the wonder kind of permanently based out here on the West coast. Well, what made you decide, you know, I'm 60 days out from a sailing and I want to do it. I want to hop on, hop on board. Uh, how did you, how did you decide to book a cruise? So we actually did have Disney cruise, um, booked again for Alaska for the summer of 2023. And we were just looking at pricing and value and what we wanted to get out of the Disney cruise. And we kind of kept coming back to why are we paying so much money for this Alaska sailing on Disney when what we want to do in Alaska 
is Alaska. And what we want to do when we sail and pay the premium for Disney is Disney. So we kind of, we started looking at other cruise lines for Alaska. We actually ended up booking Celebrity instead of Disney for this summer coming up soon. And then we were like, but we want to scratch the Disney itch. So how can we do that? And let's, you know, we saw this, this chance that aligned with our schedule out of San Diego and it was so much cheaper. We actually got the five night Disney sailing out of San Diego and the seven night celebrity sailing out of Seattle for less money than we just were going to pay for the Disney Alaska cruise. Wow. That's, that's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. I, it, the value for where you're going. So we, we encountered this a bit after we cruised in Norway, wouldn't trade the experience for anything. It was fabulous, but I did think, you know, we're spending most of our day, not on board this ship. It's constant port stops. And so, you know, what, what am I paying for uh, to, to your point? Um, because the Disney price is a lot more expensive. I'll be curious. Have you sailed other cruise lines before? Or is this your first experience outside of Disney cruise line? My husband and I have sailed Princess, Celebrity. I sailed Carnival way back in the day. Sure. So we've done, and we've we sailed a small a small ship in uh, French Polynesia um, or Fiji. Fiji it was, and uh, so we've done um, Seaborne as well. We've se- sailed, so we sailed like a wide variety. We've kind of never done a cruise line twice, but we like Celebrity. My kids have not been on any other cruise line other than okay. Disney, so this will be their first experience, um, not with the mouse and all of the kids options that come with that. So we'll see. But yeah, I mean, we, we definitely felt like we had some experience, but we were always booking cruises for the stops, not for the cru- cruise, cr- cruise itself, because right. we really like getting somewhere like someone moving us overnight while we're sleeping and then seeing new cities. So yeah. the point of Disney to me seems different. Yeah, there's there's that sort of mentality of is the ship the destination or is the ports that are the ports the destination. And I think when you start talking about places like Alaska, Europe, you know, those sorts of places, the non Caribbean, non Mexican Riviera, warm weather cruises, I think those warm weather cruises, the ship is the destination uh, because the beaches, they're nice, they're lovely. I don't want to discount any beach in the Caribbean. We've been to several that are perfectly lovely, but you're there for short periods of time and you want to see the ship and do the stuff on the ship. So yeah, I can I can totally appreciate that. We will, by the way, absolutely want to hear all about your experience on Celebrity with kids because we sailed Celebrity ages ago now and have not been back on, but have heard such great things. I'd be curious how your kids find it. Speaking of which, so you, your husband, and sounds like sounds like two kids. You want to tell folks the ages of your your two kids you're sailing with? Yes, my daughter is 14. She actually turned 14 on this cruise, which is going to be important for teen club purposes. Yeah. But uh, and then I have a son who's nine, so a little bit younger than yours, I think. Uh, yeah, uh, Nathan is nine. He'll turn 10 in November, but probably yeah, oh, right little, at the same age. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so yeah. Um, yeah, I'll be really interested to hear what your kids think of uh, think of celebrity. All right, so you decide to book at this, you know, something more than 30, less than 60 days out. Let's talk, you, you know, you mentioned in your email when you wrote in like pros and cons. Like what were some of the pros that you found? It sounds like price is a big is a big pro here. Although would be interested in your thoughts because Disney Cruise pricing tends to just go up over time. So you're paying kind of top dollar the further you get into the booking window. How how did you feel about the price of that Disney cruise as compared to maybe what you could have paid on opening day? I don't know if you went went back and did any sleuthing over what it would have cost on opening day. I didn't, uh, you okay. know, uh, see no evil, hear no there evil. There you go. Uh, <laughs> but it didn't seem that bad. I, I'm trying to remember exactly what it was. I feel like so for some reason, like five or six, 5,000, high 5,000s was kind of about where it was um, for a five night cruise. So yeah. it didn't shock the conscience. I mean, the, the s- sailing we were on for Alaska for the seven night cruise was 14 yeah. uh, for a balcony cabin. Um, so it was quite a bit more on a per night cost. And, and it did seem like, I mean, I was surprised because it was an Easter weekend cruise when it started and it's the only ship that's sailing out of California and there is a ridiculous amount of money and budget that a lot of people in LA and San Diego and San Francisco have, and they're yeah. willing to pay top dollar for Disney. I mean, you see this in the the Disneyland hotels and the price yes. escalation that's happened there. So I was really surprised. I, I thought it was actually quite the value. It ended up being cheaper, quite a bit cheaper than Aulani. And that was surprising to me too, because we're, we've gone five times to Aulani and I, and I just don't feel like they're returning as much for 
the price. And so this, this felt like a value in comparison, which is ridiculous to say, yeah. but you know, we, we've been paying used to paying that for Alani, especially with post pandemic pricing, which just got out of control. Yeah. That, I'd tell you that post pandemic pricing actually drove us to just become owners at Alani because then it's like, okay, the money is sunk and we can go for a week and I don't have to look at the ridiculous hotel bill, but yeah, uh, all the Disney properties have just gone up, up and up. And I, I recently had the experience to your point about the difference from the Alaska cruise to the San Diego cruise, uh, we decided to switch off or or in the process of switching off a spring break week cruise on Disney on the fantasy over to a Royal Caribbean Oasis class ship. Same week, it's half the price and we're staying in a crown loft suite on board Royal Caribbean at half the price of what it costs to sail at Disney. So I, I don't know. My prediction is this. Disney is going to come under some increasing price pressure on the cruise line side with Royal putting out these huge ships and putting more and more of them in Port Canaveral. So we'll check back in a, a year or two and see if that aged well or not. But that's that's <laughs> my prediction. Well, what are what were some of the other pros of booking last minute or were there any other pros of booking last minute that you found? Well, I mean, the location was really the the pro for us um, more than anything. And we live 12 minutes from the Oakland airport and we could fly to San Diego nonstop. <laughs> so, I mean, it's really just about it, it was about looking for something that was close to us, that was convenient, where we knew we wouldn't pay extraordinary costs for our travel as well. So, you know, if we lived in you know, Texas, we'd be looking at those Galveston sailings. If we yep. lived, you know, in the deep South where I grew up in Alabama, we'd be looking at those Florida sailings. So, so for me, it was more about um, finding that location that worked overall for the budget. Yeah. And I, I would say to folks out there too, if you live in one of these States that they sail out of, it's not uncommon if the ship's not full for them to do some last minute I've seen them do California resident a couple of times and it's not as ubiquitous as Florida resident. Um, I think they've also done some Texas resident rates out of uh, Galveston. I've never heard of a Louisiana resident rate for uh, the port of new Orleans, but um, you know, look at the website. There's, there's sometimes they put those last minute deals up for residents in those States to just try and fill a ship. And so waiting until last minute, sometimes not, not anywhere near all the time uh, can pay off there. Uh, I will note, however, they've, seem to have suspended Florida resident rates for some period of time here recently. There's just been nothing coming out or very little coming out. So uh, that may become harder and harder to find. Well, what are the, some of the pitfalls, Leslie, of booking last minute? I can think immediately that uh, booking onboard activities is just <laughs> going to be super limited. But what were some of those pitfall considerations you had booking last minute? I mean, it was really shore excursions and onboard activities. And I mean, I think we were to somewhat of an advantage because we purposely booked this as kind of a cruise to nowhere. I mean, it, it I, I, that's not fair to the, <laughs> the ports that we went to, but the, the port stops were in Cabo and Ensenada. And we've gone to Cabo quite a bit. Yeah. We'll go again. I didn't feel like I had to do something there. And Ensenada is a little bit of a throwaway, um, you know, so yeah. sorry, Ensenada. But <laughs> <laughs> we sometimes call it the NASA of the West. Yes. Uh, I mean... Uh, Cabo, I totally hear you on Cabo. I actually like getting off in Cabo, but it's kind of a pain because it's a tender port. And so sometimes yeah. it's nice to just sit on the ship. And then, you know, in Sonata, we've gotten off a couple times. I'd probably still get off to go grab tacos and a margarita or something, but it's not, I don't know. I, I, I have heard of some people who've had some really nice shore excursions there, so I don't want to degrade it. But if you've been a bunch of times, it's a great time to stay on the ship and experience the the ship. So I, I forgot to ask, what kind of room did you have to book a GTY that late? Or did you have, were you able to actually pick a stateroom? We were able to actually pick a stateroom. And I'm trying to remember now what deck we were on. Six, I think, oh, on the one, yeah. which was not bad. And we were towards the front of the ship, um, but not all the way at the very you know tip. I have a feeling that we got a room that somebody canceled okay. is my, is my guess. Um, because you know, just given the timing of when we booked and when people had to make final payment, et cetera, et cetera. I have a yeah. feeling that it was fuller at the 60 day, you know, 61 day mark. And then we, um, you know, swooped in there and, and were able to able to get in. So, but yeah, I mean, the cabin was great and we, we did have, uh, we just had a, um, a porthole. We didn't have okay. a balcony because we just didn't think that we needed it for that cruise. And I'm glad actually we didn't pay the extra money for the veranda because it was actually pretty chilly. You know, oh, I mean, you know, yeah. San Diego, yeah. 
doesn't get very hot a lot of the year. And I mean, you can have a heat wave, but in April, it's often, you know, six high 60s, low 70s. Yeah. And when the ship is moving, you get a breeze. And it's so we just didn't feel like we needed it. And in fact, um, I mean, it got hot by the time we got out of Cabo, but Ensenada was quite chilly as yeah. well. We didn't yeah. feel like we missed out on having the veranda and we saved a lot of money that way. Ensenada is like a half hour car drive from San Diego. So like whatever weather you're getting in San Diego, it's not going to be too much different in Ensenada. Uh, and I found that we found the same thing, like sea day from San Diego down to Cabo, cold. It wasn't until we got to Cabo that we got decent weather. And then we turned around and started heading back about halfway through the next day. It, you know, it was kind of turning cold again. So yeah, those, uh, those Mexican Riv- Riviera cruises can be a little hit or miss uh, in the, the springtime in terms of the weather. Um, but good to hear you got a pick of room. It's another good tip buried in there, by the way, which is if you're looking at last minute cruising, it's not a bad idea uh, to wait until the pay in full date and just kind of see what happens the day after. Because that's when a bunch of people are going to either move a cruise or pay for a cruise and then some inventory might might open up last minute. Um, what did you end up being able to book on board last minute? Did you even try? Yeah, we did. Um, we were able to book Palo dinner, oh, not nice. brunch. Um, and... I'm trying to remember if it was on a sea day or not, but it, whatever, it worked with the schedule we wanted. We yeah. were able to book a massage for my husband, not at an ideal time, but it again worked for our schedule, yeah. which was good. We we looked at the score, shore excursions, but anything that was any good was sold out for sure. Yeah. And then we were like, you know what? We don't really need to do a shore excursions. So we ended up getting off the ship in both ports, but just DIY did. I mean, we've been to Cabo before, so we knew how to, to navigate there, although it had changed quite a bit in the last, it's been about five years since we've been there last yeah. and just really built up and changed quite a bit. So um, some new things to, to learn and see there. We did take one of the, you know, cheap glass bottom boat uh, tour guys who are waiting right there to take you out to see uh, El Arco. And we did that. So that was nice. But uh, in Zanata, we um, hired a private driver to quickly whisk us down to the blowhole um, oh, yes. that's there in Ensenada. And it was a longer drive than I really wanted it to be just because yeah. of the traffic. So, yeah. so we were able to DIY it. We saved money over what we would have paid Disney. Although I did find that the shore excursions were not as marked up as I feared. And I'm seeing now that I'm currently booking celebrity shore excursions that other cruise lines can have much bigger mark- markup. So I guess I'm grateful yeah. for that. Yeah, I, f- I find the only way to avoid some of the markup is just book direct, but that doesn't always work in your favor either. We're actually in Cabo. We're going to Cabo in November on a Disney cruise for Thanksgiving week, and we've been looking at resort day passes. And I'll tell you, the day pass at a resort down there is about what I have to pay Disney to get me to the resort for four and a half hours, right? Uh, the only difference is I get a full day, but I still then have to pay for the uh, the transportation in some way to get there. So um, yeah, I, I share... Um, I share your observation that the port excursions may may not be so overpriced as we tend to think they are, at least some of the time. Um, What else, Leslie, did you find to be kind of a, were there any other issues you encountered kind of booking last minute or any pro tips that you have for folks looking at that? I mean, it really went quite smoothly all in all. And I was grateful to see that. I mean, I don't think I would do it for a cruise where I really wanted to score some of the most popular shore excursions. Like the cruise we originally had booked for November of 2022 was actually a seven night Mexican Riviera sailing. So it went all the way down to Puerto Vallarta and there's a really popular, I don't know if you've done it, the Las Coletas hideaway that everybody wants to be on down in Puerto Vallarta. And I had snagged that <laughs> for our <laughs> November <laughs> sailing. It sold out instantaneously and I had managed to snag that. So I'm not sure that I would uh, necessarily book that kind of a cruise if there was something I really wanted to do and there was really no other way to easily book it. But it, it worked out, especially for sort of these cruises to where you don't care as much about the ports. I highly recommend trying to snag something, especially if you're, have the flexibility to travel at an off time. And we don't because I have a daughter entering high school. So we are now firmly tied to the school schedule. But if we were not, I'd be booking last minute Disney cruises as early and often as I could, because I love to find any excuse to travel and fit (laughs) fit it in. So for those of you who have young kids who are like elementary school, not even yet in elementary school, preschool, 
just do it. And I'm grateful that we did as much travel at that age as I, you know, as we did, but we should have been done a few more Disney cruises then. Uh, yeah. I, it's nice. We can, we still, I think this year might be the last year we felt like we had the flexibility to just kind of yank our son out of school and take him on a trip. Um, I guess we're doing it next year with the very end of the school year for him. Um, so yeah, but I share, I always thought what in first and second grade, there's nothing that can't be made up at that point. So I'm not too worried about it. Um, it's interesting because we just had a couple on not long ago who booked their cruise like 31 days out. And so now I'm, I'm trying to find if you're out there and you've booked earlier than or later than 31 days, I would love to hear how close you can get to a Disney cruise before they won't let you book any longer. I don't think you can walk into the port and get on the ship and be there, but I'd be curious how far out you can book a Disney cruise before they'd say, nope, no more. Uh, we can't take your bookings. So. There was some conver conversation about that actually in our Facebook group. Um, some people were maybe, I just want to have some friends join and it's either three days or five days. I can't yeah. remember because there's a list that has to get submitted, I think to uh, customs and immigration. But, but yeah, I'm curious to know who, like who actually booked <laughs> last minute. There was somebody in our group, I think who booked um, about seven days out, so, wow. so, but they were local. They were right there in either San Diego yeah. or Orange County or something like that. Well, I'm not sure. Did When you got on board the ship, did you ask about availability for anything? Because my perception, aside from shore excursions, I really don't think they hold back too much inventory on shore excursions. But for things like Palo and the spa, I mean, it always seems like the spa is trying to entice people in. So, you know, if you can't book your massage at 100 and, you know, whatever days out, I don't think that's the end of the question. I think when you get on, they've probably held back a bunch of inventory for onboard booking. But did you ask anything like about maybe your Palo brunch or anything like that to see if you could you could get in? We did. So we actually ended up boarding quite late. And the reason uh, was we were staying at Hotel Del Coronado, which is a lovely hotel in San Diego that I've always uh, had on my bucket list. So we wanted to maximize our time there. And yeah. so we booked purposefully a late boarding time because at that point we were like, we were happy with what we had, had secured. We had, I, I don't love like adjusting on the fly. I like having a plan and an itinerary and going with it. So yeah. I felt happy with what we had done. And then actually, so we didn't inquire about any of the shore excursions or anything like that, but we did go check in with Palo a little bit later in the cruise. And there was tons of availability at Palo. And mm -hmm. I actually was surprised. We were able to get a brunch reservation that we ended up not doing just because it didn't work ultimately with, with our overall schedule. We were able to move our dinner reservation to a better time so there was a lot of, and then when we dined at Palo, it was only half full. I was yeah. very, very surprised. And I think it was in part because of the type of cruise we were on, the length. And I think it was a lot more families because of it being that Easter weekend cruise mm. and a lot of parents of young kids who didn't want to leave the kids for that long of a dinner. So yeah. I think that may have been a little bit of a unique situation, but I mean, there's certainly cr other cruises where this kind of, uh, thing is going to be repl replicated. So yeah. it was far easier than we expected. Yeah, I've always been, every time we've had Palo Brunch in the last year or so, I've always, like, it feels like there are tables available still. So uh, just highly, highly encourage, like, don't view it as, oh, I didn't get whatever when I was doing my pre-booking or if you book last minute, I can't get it. I, I know, we know, we know <laughs> they are holding back some amount of inventory for onboard booking so that, Folks who get on the ship and are like, I never even knew there was a Palo. They can they can get a seat there or get a dinner there. Yeah. Dinner seems to be really easy to get because it happens every night of the cruise. Brunch is the wild card because it typically only happens on sea days with, you know, f a few exceptions uh, here and there. Well, so Leslie, you've been on the Wonder now twice, if I understand correctly. <laughs> um, <Yes. laughs> which, uh, don't, uh, hey, the Wonder is one of our favorite ships. So I, I think you've picked a fabulous ship to go on twice. Um, any thought on trying to get on board the other ships? I guess you you move the Alaska cruise to a different cruise line, but any other thoughts on trying to get on board some of the other ships? Sure. So, I mean, I guess if we had done the Alaska cruise, it would be the wonder again. So, yeah, fair enough. <laughs> good, good th <laughs> in three different, entirely different geographies and, and uh, destinations. So, uh, yeah, we would love to get on some other ships. And I, I haven't really talked yet about the 14-year-old, the but she loved, loved, loved the teen clubs. And so much so that the first thing she said to us at the end of the cruise was, you know, I'm kind of in like the prime moment for um, vibe. 
And, you know, everybody on in Vibe is 13, 14, 15, 16. And she said, I really want to do a lot more Disney cruises the next two years. So <laughs> we're on the hunt. We have our deposit down. In fact, nice. we're looking right now. Um, maybe it's some Christmas, maybe some other break here. But again, we kind of were more last minute people. Like I know the schedule was just released for <laughs> summer with like summer no fall winter uh 2024 we're not even yes. close to that we're like 2023 winter so it's yeah. just it's too hard especially once your kids get into this you know high school and yeah. she didn't even know in high school she was going to attend we didn't have a schedule a calendar until april mm-hmm. of this past year so that's what we're dealing with well, and after school activities and sports and clubs sports. Yeah, it's, it's harder to get away for sure i i will tell you though Get on like the fantasy because that vibe club is one I wish they would recreate for adults. It's amazing with these like okay. these like cool pods you can sit in and play video games and a juice bar. And they have uh, where the rainforest room is on the wish out on the front of the ship. That's where the team club pool is on the fantasy and the dreams. So they get this like private little pool area where they can go lounge and sit outside and all that sort of stuff. So it's uh quite the uh, the upgrade from the wonder and the magic if she enjoys those vibe clubs she'd probably love the fantasy or the dream even um and the the wish is the wish is good i think they really made strides in the little kids kids club you know the one that your son would probably go to um the teens clubs were nice but i just didn't feel like they were a significant upgrade to what they had uh, on the dream and the fantasy so yeah definitely get her to okay. check those out I will. Yeah. That's that's really good to know. One of the ones we're looking at, I think, is the fantasy that we've been sort of batting around for a couple of months. And so we'll, we'll finally uh, pull, pull the trigger and <laughs> make one of these bookings one of these days. But, you know, honestly, it wasn't as much about the physical location or the, you know, the offerings yeah. in the club itself. It was about the other kids for my yeah. daughter. Like she's super social and she wanted to meet other kids her age. And then they, you know, her 14th birthday present, which she got on the cruise, was uh, a cell phone. So she was then, you know, able to use the cell phone and the the DCL app to communicate with people or text with people and meet up. And and it was great. There was just a huge crew of them. And they were all very good teenagers, I have to say. Like they would go do their thing all day long and 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 then they would come back and meet their families at the appointed times for like dinners and shows and things like that. So it was it was a really great group of kids all in all. And she made a lot of friends. They have a group text that they still are on. Now, nice. what are we, three, three months later that they all still stay in communication all around the country. So very impressed by that. Yeah, it's it's so fun to watch. It's been fun to watch our son grow up with uh, on Disney Cruise Line and how he has evolved, like, you know, from going to the club and staying in the club to we've given him the freedom now to check himself in and out. And he, he messages us where he's headed and, you know, makes friends and they go explore the ship together. It's, it's, it's nice to see that level of independence. Um, it'll be interesting when we finally hit the days it starts like you're starting to hit where it's like, I, and we've heard this from guests on the show. I don't, I don't see my teenager except at dinner. <laughs> they're, they're up, they have a curfew, they come in, they go to bed. I, you know, uh, I see them at dinner time and the rest of the time is kind of adult time for us. So yeah, it's an interesting age to hit. I'm sure. Um, well, Leslie, I'd be remiss because you have such a wealth of Disney experience outside the cruise line, at least not asking you a, a bit of your favorites from the rest of the Disney experience. So uh, I'm. let me start with one of our favorites. It's the closest we can get to Disney Cruise Line on land, which is Elani. Um, any pro tips for folks headed to Elani? I know you've been quite a bit. I think you said five times in the last uh, year or so. So yeah, pro tips for folks heading to Elani or thinking about doing an Elani vacation, aside from go because once you're there it that is a resort that just sells itself i'll tell you what <laughs> once you're there it's amazing but yeah any pro tips you have for folks visiting alani sure well let me first clarify it's five times in my life not five times oh uh, okay year. <laughs> 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 i don't have that kind of vacation time uh, um, <laughs> my husband my husband works a, as an attorney at a big law in san francisco there was no way he would get that kind of time off <laughs> so um <laughs> So in any event, but we we actually went for the first time when I was expecting my nine-year-old. That was our first trip. And that was only about a year after Aulani opened. So it was very early on. They were still building the final phase of the resort. They didn't have the spa and that whole adults pool area, which I know you know, which now I guess is an adults pool, but there you go. So, I mean, advice for Aulani, I mean... it's, It's really extraordinarily expensive right now for a lot of families, but a lot of Disney fans want to get that taste. And so I really recommend if you're 
constrained by budget as we all are, book a shorter stay at Alani and only stay on the resort for that period of time. Do everything there is to do. Get your value maximally out of that and then hotel hop to somewhere else, either on another island or in Waikiki. There's a lot of like, you know, inexpensive timeshares or just utilitarian hotels or the RBOs, something like that. So I really do think it's the price has gotten out of control and made it out of reach for a lot of families. I mean, you can save some money with DVC rentals if you don't yep. aren't a DVC member, but th- they're sometimes hard to get at peak times, um, depending upon your schedule. So, so. I think you need three nights to really take value, maximum value out of it. Um, if you can do four, all the better. But don't plan to take a lot of excursions because I do see a lot of people going for like a week or 10 days and then they have left the resort for the full day. And unless, you know, you're printing money, it's just not a great value. And and we this was a problem for us, actually, because we loved Alani so much. We would go and we'd never leave the resort. And then we were like, we've been to Oahu you know, three times and we've never seen anything other than the Honolulu airport and Alani resort. (laughs) So so we did start expanding, you know, take, we take one day to be a day trip or something like that. And then more recently, about a year ago, we did go finally stay at a Waikiki hotel, which fairly disappointed. And, and we were back to Alani, but it did get us to do all the things on Oahu that we had always wanted to do Pearl Harbor and Diamond Head, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, I would echo that look at the rental as well for DVC, because you can save yourself some money with the DVC rooms, not just the the price of the room itself, but they've got like full kitchens in them. And there's a nice little grocery right across the street from Alani or a Costco on the way from the airport. And you can you can kind of save yourself a little money uh, on meals there. And also, the other nice thing is it's not like going to Disney World where you are you know, fundamentally, if you want to have a good experience, you're kind of stuck on property and paying Disney prices for food. Uh, Alani is surrounded by uh, some great restaurants uh, across the street or, you know, just like a mile or two up the road uh, in a car. You can go to not Koalina. I forget the stop right before Koalina, but they've got a ton of restaurants in that area that you can you can go to and save a little money. So. Um, so, yeah, that's that. Those are great tips, Leslie. Um, Disney World. Uh, that vacation seems like it's out of control, not just from price, but complexity. Any big, any big pro <laughs> tips to unlock uh, the Disney World vacation? Because we're, we're in the middle. Well, not in the middle. We have planned one. We've got one later this month. We've got a whirlwind Star Cruiser, Disney World, Disney Cruise for uh, some friend's wedding uh, in Orlando. And I'll tell you what, juggling all of the when do we have to be up at midnight to do this stuff and, and everything has been kind of a nightmare. I, I don't know. Are you feeling like it's gotten so complex and so expensive that it's really gotten itself out of reach or any tips you have? I mean, it has gotten so complex and anything I say here now is <laughs> going to change, yeah. you know, and we, we know that there's going to be changes coming to Genie Plus probably at the turn of the, the new year. And, you know, it's already so complex and they've added this extra layer of complexity recently by having different prices for the different parks. Genie Plus, I mean, oh my gosh, but it is a lot. I mean, if you you guys go to Disneyland, so you have the base level of knowledge that you need. But I mean, for me, and I hate I hate saying this, but like you've just got to stay on property at Walt Disney World if you if you care about doing the rides and maximizing the value of your ticket. I mean, not not being on property, not having that transportation, not having that seven a.m. Lightning Lane purchase for individual Lightning Lane you know, it, it just, it's too much of a pain point. So mm-hmm. Disney's going to get your money. I mean, I always stay, almost always stay off, off property at Disneyland, but I okay. never stay off property at Disney world. Cause I think you just need those perks and the early entry that, you know, come with that. So, I mean, I guess you could stay at one of like Swan Dolphin. So it's sort of the, those hybrid places that have some of the perks, but I think you've got to, got to pay Disney for the, the upcharge. But I, I think it does think, help to think about your logistics at Disney World far in advance. So on my last trip with my son, um, about my last trip I took kids to um, was about a year ago. And it was peak summer. It was miserably, miserably hot. And I just wanted to like maximize the park time with minimally like walking and dealing with non-air conditioned places. So we stayed at a Skyliner Resort, which was great. Yeah. And we could hop very quickly back to our hotel. We could go easily then to um, Epcot or Hollywood Studios in the afternoon, super quickly without getting too hot. 
So, I mean, we got hot because it was, <laughs> it was late June. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah. I think, think about those logistics. Like, you know, if you have young kids, you're going to spend a lot of time at Magic Kingdom, Monorail Resort. So think about what you want to do and get out of, um, you know, and I think that does help minimize the pain a lot. But I agree with you, Brian. It's it's a lot of work and, you know, Iger's got to got to make some changes, make this this not be quite so painful. I think it's starting to show we've been hearing we heard at Disneyland this past weekend when we went or I think it was this past weekend that we went and uh, we heard from a cast member that like the hotels, he could book cast member rates, any resort, any level, including club level, any room tech category available. And, you know, the park attendants seem to be sort of way down uh, this summer. And we're hearing the same thing about sort of Disney World, that park attendance seems to be um uh, hurting a little bit. So uh, it may be that the complexity and the cost have finally kind of come around to bite Disney a little bit. And we may see some, uh, some more, we've seen lots of discounts, I feel like. I mean, I feel like I'm seeing more discounts come across my email for pass holders and Visa card holders and DVC members and all this sort of stuff. So maybe it will start to abate a little bit. Leslie, I'm curious, you know, what what Disney property do you think right now actually has good value for the dollar or the, the best value for the dollar in Disney? Is it the cruise line? Is it Alani? Is it going to one of the parks? Like where do you think people can get the most bang for their buck these days? I mean, for me this year, based upon what our family needs and wants out of a vacation, it was cruise line. Okay. And that was surprising because I always considered cruise line to be a price step above the parks. And it is, if you're, you know, you can do the parks on the cheap, you can stay at a value resort in Florida, you can stay off property at Disneyland for sure. And you can do those cheaper, but in terms of, of what you, what you got for that price increase, the value to me was more with cruise line right now. And that, that surprised me. And like I say, you know, my daughter's is hooked and, and we're hooked. And, um, <laughs> I promise though your job is safe. I'm not coming for you. I'm not doing it. Uh, cruise line podcast. <laughs> right. The more the merrier come join the conversation. No, it's funny. Cause we heard that recently from another guest too. We heard that, you know, if you start to pray, if you, if to your point, if you stay at deluxe resorts or moderate resorts and you tend to eat on property and you're buying genie plus like those costs quickly add up and suddenly Disney cruise doesn't seem so out of reach. Uh, in fact, in some ways, I think it will pencil out as uh, as cheaper because um, you have very few things that you add on for the cruise, I feel like. Th so. That was what surprised us most of all is, you know, the upcharges were minimal for what we were doing. We actually went to Target and, you know, bought my, my uh, Disney gift card before the trip just to save a little 5% with yeah. the red card. And I only, I was like, how much, you know, how much am I actually going to spend on this cruise? Like, what do I need to put on my onboard account? And I think I only bought like a $400 gift card and we ended up, I think, spending more like six or $700 because mainly because the massage. Yeah. Yeah. But in terms of everything else, the Palo dinner, the couple of drinks that we bought, um, we really didn't need to pay for any extras. And we were so entertained the entire time. I mean, we we were heavily into the trivia. Um, I have three members of my family, um, not myself, who can sing. So we did a lot of karaoke nice. and I was cheering in the audience um, <laughs> happily. <laughs> so we, we were able to feel like we filled our calendar um, from wake up until late, late night and yeah. didn't have to pay for anything. So that was great. Yeah, that is great. That is great to hear. Well, Leslie, I super appreciate you taking time today to come talk with us. Um, I mentioned your your blog and the podcast up front, but you want to tell folks a little bit more about that and how they can find you and, and uh, hear more of your great tips and tricks? Sure. Thank you. So my blog is Trips with Tykes, T-Y-K-E-S. And mine, as you can tell, aren't really tykes anymore. So I've been <laughs> blogging for... Uh, gosh, 11 years now. So it's been a long time coming, but I have a lot of Disneyland um, and then all sorts of Disney destinations on there, as well as lots of, you know, California and wherever our family happens to go, which is a lot of other places as well. So you can find me there and at Trips with Tykes everywhere on social. And then Joe and I have the Disney Deciphered podcast and that's everywhere fine podcasts are sold. And then I also have a, a Facebook group, the Disneyland with Kids Facebook group that I share with three other 
fabulous bloggers and we talk a lot about family travel to Disneyland because that that is the Disney destination I get to the most. So yes. Yes. it's much, much quicker. I, I flew in recently about a, about 10 days ago for just a day trip, which was crazy. But yeah, I, I love that we have Disneyland on the West Coast because it's one, our favorite park out of the entire Disney system. Now we haven't been overseas yet, but still our favorite park uh, thus far. And it's just, it's so nice to be able to like go to a park in our own time zone. <laughs> California, the, the weather gets hot, but it doesn't get quite as oppressive as it does in Florida. Um, and we love to do the, I think the routine you were suggesting, which is we get up early, we get our rides in at one of the parks and then we lays by the pool for the afternoon benefit from the resort that we're paying so much for and then head back in for dinner what's your uh, you know leslie what's your favorite uh what's your favorite spot at disneyland these days i'm just curious i mean i love the disneyland hotel i always have i'm a history geek i i feel like when i step into the lobby there that you feel kind of the presence and the weight of the disney history there and, um, yeah, so that's really my favorite place. I mean, it's not a great hotel objectively. I mean, it's, it's nice, but it's not a super luxurious hotel objectively, but that's not why I love it. I love it for the legacy that it sort of embodies. And, um, it's just, it, it's magical with the light up headboard, you know, that's, yeah. that, that word is overused in Disney, but it really is. Yeah. Well, I just hope they bring back another restaurant to the Disneyland Hotel. I think they I need one more restaurant there. That closure of uh, Steakhouse 55 still hurts. So I'm hoping they're not just planning to expand Goofy's Kitchen. They bring back some sort of unique offering there. But uh, we were at the chef's table recently at Napa Rose and we couldn't tease anything out of the, <laughs> out of the step there. But we're hoping, <laughs> we're hoping, as, especially with that new tower opening in September, I feel like they're going to need another restaurant to service the hotel. So, well, Leslie, thank you once again for taking the time today. We really, really appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me, Brian.